This video will be addressing a few comments made by an individual named Yusha Evans on a program called The Dean Show. So, let's watch the first clip. Basically, you know, if you can break an atheist to a point down to look, just look around you, you know? Look, look around you at this beautiful universe. It runs in constant harmony. All these billions, the numbers that are not even invented, of planets, they run in a perfect manner, perfect orbit, they don't cross over each other, they don't have anything, just look at this world. Yusha Evans' concept of planetary orbits is consistent with the Copernican model of our solar system, but unfortunately for him, that model is about 400 years out of date. It was in 1609 that Johannes Kepler published Astronomia Nova, meaning the new astronomy, a book that revealed his findings that the orbit of Mars was elliptical. This marked the end of the era where planetary orbits were viewed as perfect circles and the beginning of an era where they were seen as the ellipses they really are. But that was just the beginning of Yusha Evans' mistakes, all of which went uncorrected by the host, Eddie Dean. Yusha said that of all the planetary orbits in the universe, no two of them, quote, cross over each other, end quote. I was even more surprised to hear this, as all it takes is a quick glance at any model of our solar system made after 1930, when Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto. As anyone can see, Pluto's orbit clearly crosses that of Neptune's. Now, you might be thinking, well, technically Pluto is not considered a planet anymore, it's considered a planetesimal. The problem with that is that Yusha said that no two planetary orbits in the entire universe cross, so it remains clear that either way, he's very unfamiliar with the basic layout of our solar system, since familiarity would have prevented him from ever putting forward such an argument in the first place. So, at this point, you might now be thinking, fine, but it's still amazing that planets don't intersect or collide. To address this, we'll need to examine how planets form and how they acquire the orbits that they do. As dust and gas in the protoplanetary disk orbited the protosun, particles in significantly non-circular orbits collided with other particles, eventually dampening out their non-circular motion. The result was that the large-scale motion in the disk material formed parallel, near-circular orbits. Low-velocity collisions of gas and dust particles due to the formation of eddies caused them to stick together through electrostatic forces to form planetesimals. The gravity of the larger planetesimals attracted other planetesimals, which increased their size, a process called accretion, and divided the solar nebula into ring-shaped zones. In fact, astronomers at UCSC recently published a paper in the January 12th issue of the journal Nature indicating that such collisions, quote, may account for some previously unexplained properties of planets, asteroids, and meteorites, end quote. Also, some other astronomers in Austin, Texas, just announced that object 2M1207b in orbit around a star about 170 light-years from Earth may have resulted from the, quote, collision and merger of two protoplanets, end quote. The fact of the matter is that between the tendency towards near-circular orbits, the sheer vastness of our solar system relative to the size of the planets in those orbits, and the billions of years any planets on probable collision courses would have had to collide, it's no surprise at all that the planets orbit in the way they do. Unfortunately, once again, Yusha's mistakes don't end there. Let's see what he has to say about the Earth's ability to sustain life. They don't have anything. Just look at this world. This world is in the perfect place to sustain life. We're at a couple feet closer to the sun. Nothing would live here. A couple of feet farther, everything would be frozen. If it rotated on the axis, any different. You know, like all of these everything things. Everything is perfect. In perfect, I mean, to the exact degree. As I've previously explained, Earth's orbit is not circular. It's elliptical, with the sun positioned at one focus of the ellipse. This means that Earth does not stay at a constant distance from the sun. In early January of each year, the Earth is at perihelion, or closest to the Sun, at about 91.3 million miles. In early July of each year, the Earth is at aphelion, or furthest from the Sun, at about 94.4 million miles. The Earth's distance from the Sun is constantly changing, and each year, that change is about 3.1 million miles. To put it in the words of Scott J. Bradham of the Department of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Wyoming, quote, Although it may seem that Earth's relative distance to the Sun would be a prominent factor in determining seasonal changes in temperature, it pales in comparison to the prominence of the planet's axial tilt with respect to controlling temperature, or more accurately, distribution of solar energy. End quote. 
In fact, Earth's average temperature at perihelion is about 4 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 2.3 degrees Celsius, lower than it is in aphelion. Now, the term proven is often misused. His extensive books on, you know, the proof of the universe, this, that, and the proof inside every other thing. But in this case, the fact that the annual change in distance between the Sun and Earth, as well as the effect of that change, are all directly observable, Yusha's argument is actually proven wrong. Now, there is another argument I've heard, along the same lines as Yusha's, that, on the surface, makes a lot more sense. If you're interested in hearing my refutation of that argument, watch this video. A link is provided in the video description area.